Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm your instructor, Jim Pytel, and today's topic of discussion is pressure and pressure measurement. Our objective is to differentiate between gauge, absolute, and differential pressure and examine common means of measuring pressure. Recall that pressure is defined as force exerted per unit area. Common units of pressure include pound force per square inch, often abbreviated as PSI, and pascals, where one pascal is equivalent to a newton of force applied over one square meter of area. Newtons are small units of force, and applied over a comparatively large area like one square meter means the pascal is a comically small unit of pressure. For this reason, engineering prefixes are commonly employed when utilizing pascals, as in kilopascals and megapascals, where the kilo prefix means 1,000 and the mega prefix means 1 million. Another common unit of pressure, the bar, is equivalent to 14.5 psi, which happens to be equivalent to 100 kilopascals. If you are as skilled in unit conversion as I expect you to be, it should be a trivial matter to convert between pressure measurements using different unit systems. Pause the lecture and try these example problems on for size. This should be a review of the techniques I illustrated in the unit conversion and hydraulics math lecture. If you get the same answers I do, you're tracking. If you don't, you're off track and need to get yourself back on track as soon as possible because this train is rolling with or without you. If you did the unit conversions correctly, you should have obtained the following results. 500 PSI is roughly equivalent to 34.5 bar. 800 PSI is roughly equivalent to 5.5 megapascals. 20 bar is equivalent to 2 megapascals. 12 bar is roughly equivalent to 174 psi. 650 kilopascals is roughly equivalent to 95.6 psi. And 1.6 megapascals is equivalent to 16 bar. If you obtain different values, by all means, pause the lecture and examine these unit conversion calculations I performed. Remember, unit conversion is the process of multiplying a quantity by one, where one is chosen such that the unit you want is on top and the unit you don't want is on the bottom. The units you don't want cancel out and you're left with an equivalent value expressed in the units you want. In addition to the units of PSI, bar, and pascals, pressure can also be expressed as head, where head represents the vertical differential between two pools of water. This term is still commonplace for some industries like hydroelectric power generation. Consider a cubic foot of water weighing approximately 62.4 pounds. Given this cubic foot of water distributes the weight evenly over the 12 inch by 12 inch bottom surface of the cube, it can be said a cubic foot of water exerts a pressure of approximately 0.43 psi. What is interesting to note that it is not the size of the pool that influences pressure on the bottom surface, only the pool's depth. Consider a one foot deep pool containing 10 cubic feet of water. This would exert a force of 624 pounds on an area of 1,440 square inches, again for a pressure of approximately 0.43 psi. If, however, the pool was 10 feet deep and still contained 10 cubic feet of water, every single cubic foot of water would be stacked upon the cubic foot of water below it and exert increasing pressure on the 12 inch by 12 inch bottom surface. In this case, a 10 foot deep column of water exerts 624 pounds on 144 square inches for pressure of approximately 4.3 psi. It can be therefore said that 10 feet of head is roughly equivalent to 4.3 psi of pressure. You'll sometimes see the terms head and pressure used interchangeably, especially for older systems. Moving on, realize there are different reference points one can use to measure pressure. The base standard most of humanity uses, since we spend an inordinate amount of time on it, is the surface of the earth. One of the reasons humanity prefers living on Earth rather than the vacuum of space is largely due to the blanket of breathable atmosphere surrounding it. The atmosphere, although invisible, unless you live in Denver, has mass and exerts pressure on the objects below it, notably all the cows, trees, people, and fluid power systems located on the surface of the Earth. At standard temperature and humidity conditions at sea level, a one inch square column of atmosphere exerts 14.7 pounds of force. This is similar to the pressure exerted on the bottom of a column of liquid we discussed when examining head. Atmospheric pressure is therefore 14.7 psi greater than a perfect vacuum. 
This implies that there are two standards of judging pressure, the surface of the Earth and the vacuum of space. Starting at perfect vacuum conditions, we can make a scale called absolute pressure, where perfect vacuum is assumed to exert no force per unit area and therefore has a pressure of 0 psi A. Using this scale, the surface of the Earth therefore has an absolute pressure of 14.7 psi A. Note the A modifier. It means absolute pressure, as in this is a special measurement that necessitates a call to attention. All other pressure measurements, unless explicitly stated otherwise using the A modifier, are to always be considered gauge pressure measurements, meaning they are measured from the standard temperature and elevation conditions normally found at sea level. This means normal atmospheric conditions are to be considered zero psi gauge. Since most humans live on Earth and most fluid power systems operate on Earth, it's far easier to use the gauge standard rather than the absolute standard. Pressures below atmospheric conditions are considered vacuums with varying degrees of strength. Sometimes you'll see gauge pressures expressed as PSIG to make it perfectly clear which standard is being employed. The easiest way to compare and contrast the two systems is to place them both side by side. Consider 14.7 psi A, standard atmospheric conditions on the absolute scale. This equates to 0 psi or 0 psi G if you want to be painstakingly clear. A fluid power system at atmospheric conditions simultaneously has a pressure of 14.7 psi A and 0 psi. These pressure measurements are equivalent to one another. Which one is easier to conceptualize that the system is not under pressure? Gauge pressure is the obvious choice, and that's why people use it. A pressure gauge of 0 psi indicates the system is not under pressure. Consider a gauge reading of 400 psi. What is the equivalent psi A pressure measurement using the absolute scale? Don't make this hard. 400 psi gauge is 400 plus 14.7 or 414.7 psi A. Look at it. All you have to do is account for the different starting points for the two different scales. In summary, absolute pressure is zero referenced against a perfect vacuum. An absolute pressure reading is therefore equal to gauge pressure plus atmospheric pressure. In contrast, gauge pressure is zero referenced against ambient air pressure. A gauge pressure reading is equal to absolute pressure minus atmospheric pressure. Let's put your understanding of this simple concept to the test. Given the following pressure measurements, convert to the desired scale. Don't make this hard and don't dork this up. By all means, pause the lecture and take your best shot. A reading of 640 PSI absolute is equivalent to 625.3 PSI gauge. A reading of 900 PSI gauge is equivalent to 914.7 psi absolute. Finally, 800 psi gauge is equal to 800 psi gauge. Again, units of psi without a modifier is assumed to be gauge pressure. I must again emphasize that fluid power systems customarily use gauge pressure with common atmospheric conditions being the zero reference. Finally, it should be noted that in addition to absolute and gauge pressure, a third type of pressure measurement exists, known as differential pressure. As the title implies, differential pressure necessitates a two-point measurement, and the result is the difference between the two points. A pressure differential of 50 psi exists between one point at 400 psi and another at 350 psi, as does one point at 5,000 psi and the other at 4,950 psi, regardless if the readings are in gauge or absolute. The differential is simply the difference between the two points. It should be noted that Pascal's law states that pressure in a confined fluid is equal everywhere. Flowing fluid, however, converts static pressure to velocity, and a pressure measurement of flowing fluid will read less than a static system under pressure. Consider a moving piston face compressing a cylinder such that a quantity of fluid is forced out of the cylinder and into a narrow hose or pipe. Given continuity in which the same quantity of fluid leaving the cylinder must travel through the hose, fluid in the larger cylinder is moving much slower than fluid in the narrow hose, since fluid in the hose is moving through a much smaller cross-sectional area. 
Additionally, pressure drops occur due to the viscosity of the fluid resisting flow. Regardless, when flow stops, pressure quickly equalizes throughout the confined fluid and the most common application of Pascal's law again holds true. Before we transition to our next topic, let's chat briefly about atmospheres and bar. At risk of seeing imprecise, one atmosphere is one bar. Atmospheric pressure conditions aren't constant and vary depending upon your location on Earth. Elevation is an influencing factor, as are weather conditions. Pressure decreases roughly 0.5 psi per 1,000 feet of elevation gain. It makes sense, since there will be less hot, sticky, fat air laying on top of Denver than there is smothering the malarial lowlands of Mississippi. This is to suggest that differing locations and times have subtle atmospheric pressure-induced differences, however, for our purposes, are negligible. Let's now discuss pressure measurement. Pressure gauges, sometimes called manometers, are used to display pressure readings at various points in a fluid power system. Gauges could be fixed at critical locations or inspection ports at various points allow a technician to insert a mobile pressure gauge and take a reading. The inspection ports and portable pressure gauges have quick disconnect fittings that include a check valve. The check valve is closed when the fittings are disconnected to ensure no fluid leaks from the system while conducting normal operations. And the check valves open when the fittings are connected to conduct fluid to the manometer measuring apparatus. Note the quick disconnect fittings include dust covers to prevent the intrusion of contaminants into the fluid power system. Make sure you replace the cover after taking a pressure reading. Analog pressure gauges are those gauges that display the pressure reading on a dial or a vertical scale with a needle similar to the hand of a clock or the height of a liquid in a thermometer. Given the subjective nature of the analog scale, there will be room for interpretation and inexactness. In contrast, a digital pressure gauge displays an exact numerical pressure reading in the desired units with no room for subjective interpretation. Digital pressure gauges sometimes include additional features like data logging and transmission capabilities. Digital pressure gauges obviously include more hardware, necessitate electrical power, and are more expensive than analog gauges. Two common types of analog pressure measurement devices are Bordon tube and spring-loaded piston gauges, sometimes called Schrader gauges. Both methods necessitate a passageway to the fluid under pressure. A Bordon tube is a curved metal tube linked with a pointer. When pressurized fluid enters the curved metal tube, the tube is distended and the mechanically linked pointer moves along the calibrated scale like the hand on a clock. Sometimes the dial and board on tube pressure gauges are oil dampened to limit erratic movement of the needle or cushion it against surges. The schematic symbol for a pressure gauge looks astoundingly similar to a board on tube pressure gauge. A spring-loaded piston gauge, as the name implies, uses a piston held down with a spring to measure pressure. As pressurized fluid pushes on the piston, the spring is compressed and the attached needle slides up and down the vertical scale like a thermometer. Given both these methods utilize the distortion of an object to measure pressure, be aware of pressure gauges exposed to pressures in excess of manufacturer recommended maximum conditions. The tube on a Bordon tube pressure gauge or the spring in a spring-loaded piston gauge could be permanently damaged and the gauge would no longer accurately measure pressure. Electrical means of pressure measurement include pressure switches and pressure sensors or transducers. A pressure switch, as the name implies, is a switch with a normal deactivated state that when triggered by pressure conditions in excess of its pressure set point is activated into its opposite activated state. When pressure falls to that of the reset value, the switch returns to its normal deactivated state. The difference between set and reset values is a region called span and is essential to the proper operation of a pressure switch. The span differential prevents a pressure switch close to the set point from chattering between the deactivated and activated state. The set point might be fixed or adjustable via a knob or dial on the pressure switch. Sometimes the span is also adjustable. Note since pressure switches are points of interaction between the fluid power and electrical aspects of an electrically controlled fluid power system, pressure switches have two different schematic symbols for the same device. The fluid power schematic symbol for a pressure switch includes the variable set point adjustment 
and a simplified version of a single pole double throw switch. This is the electrical schematic symbol for a normally closed pressure switch, and this is the electrical schematic symbol for a normally open pressure switch. The normally closed pressure switch opens when it is activated by pressures in excess of the set point. The normally open pressure switch closes when it is activated by pressures in excess of the set point. Sometimes both the normally closed and normally open switch can be included in the same package, either as a single pole double throw transfer switch with a common center, or as two electrically isolated single pole single throw switches with a mechanical interlock between. In either configuration, when exposed to pressure conditions in excess of the set point, the normally closed side opens and the normally open side closes. The electrical schematic symbol includes a semicircle with a flattened bottom which gives a clue as to how a pressure switch operates. Fluid under pressure is exposed to a distendable or movable disc. As pressure distorts the disc, electrical contacts change states when a certain level of distortion is achieved. As previously stated, pressure switches exposed to pressures in excess of manufacturer recommended maximum conditions might be permanently damaged and the switch might activate at incorrect pressures if it activated at all. Pressure switches, it should be noted, are binary in nature, meaning they can be placed in one of two mutually exclusive states, either open or closed, and never a little bit of both or halfway in between. Pressure sensors, in contrast, measure the distortion of the disk and output an electrical voltage or current signal proportional to the amount of distortion. Pressure sensors are sometimes known as pressure transducers and differ from switches and that they are also analog pressure measurement devices. More pressure means more electrical signal. The analog electrical signal of a pressure sensor can be used by a computer to make automated decisions about the process under control, necessitating no human intervention or monitoring. The schematic symbol for a pressure sensor is a box with a diagonal slash through it, sometimes with the letter PT for pressure transducer. Be aware of alternate schematic symbols printing manufacturer or country of origin. Note that pressure sensors are key to the operation of the previously mentioned digital pressure gauges. The internal circuitry in the digital pressure gauge converts the analog electrical signal generated by the pressure sensor to a number capable of being displayed on a readout or digitized and transmitted via a communication network. We'll examine pressure switches, pressure sensors, and more used to coordinate the activity of electrically controlled fluid power systems in later lectures. All right, this about wraps up our discussion on pressure and pressure measurement. In conclusion, this lecture took a brief look at atmospheric, absolute, gauge, and differential pressure, and examined common pressure measurement devices, including the Bordon tube pressure gauge, the spring-loaded piston pressure gauge, the pressure switch, and the pressure sensor or transducer. Remember to review these concepts as often as you need to really drive it home. Imagine how well lab will go if you know what you're doing. Thank you very much for your attention and interest, and we'll see you again during the next lecture of our series. Remember to tell your Lazy Lab partner about this resource, and be sure to check out the Big Bad Tech channel for additional resources and updates.